In the previous few lectures, we've covered the basic concept of frequency response, uh, looked at some of the Bode plots. We've also learned how to sketch the Bode plots for any arbitrary transfer function. And we've looked at some filtering circuits, uh, which basically allow us to build filters that will you know, only allow certain bandwidths of uh, frequencies to pass through. For example, we looked at a first order low pass filter as well as a first order high pass filter um, that we built using uh, simple RC circuits. Uh, today we're going to continue our discussion with frequency response as well uh, as well as filtering the circuits, uh, but now given the ability to sketch the Bode plot for any arbitrary transfer function, we can look at more uh, circuits in depth and we can look at their frequency responses as well. Um, going back to uh, the low pass uh, going back to the low pass filtering idea, um, the, there, there are many examples or, or scenarios where you might want to build a circuit uh, that only allows low, pa uh, low frequency signals to pass through. Um, this is especially true in the, the audio industry, so if you're building a nice sound system uh, and you're going to use a big subwoofer to produce low end frequencies, you don't want to pass high frequencies through that speaker, so you would put a low pass uh, filter, uh, which would essentially filter out all of the high frequency stuff and only allow the low frequencies to pass through to that big low subwoofer speaker, which uh, is, is all that that speaker is good for, is producing those low frequencies. Um, additionally, low pass filtering is, is also used in uh, sensing in both control systems and robotics where um, Depending on the type of sensor you're using, um, you're going to inevitably introduce uh, noise into your system. Um, and sensor noise generally has the characteristic that it occurs um, at higher frequencies, and high frequency sensor noise can uh, wreak havoc on control systems. Um, so low pass filtering is very prominent in, in those types of systems where you want to kind of squash out as much of that noise as possible without affecting the dynamics of the system. Okay, so, so there's a lot of practical applications for uh, low-pass filters. Uh, generally speaking, a low-pass filter has the property that uh, it will, for some frequencies, allow, uh, allow that range to pass through. So the magnitude will basically be equal to 1 for some range of frequencies. And then after some de predetermined cutoff, which we'll call omega naught, then you would expect to see some attenuation. So you'd want to see the magnitude start to drop off and approach zero for higher frequencies. That would indicate that those higher frequencies above omega naught, uh, not, not necessarily that they would completely be squashed out, but they would be uh, substantially attenuated in the output. Uh, now, an ideal sort of theoretical optimal low-pass filter actually looks something like this. So you would allow all these frequencies below omega naught to pass through, and then for frequencies greater than omega naught, you would you would basically see uh, a vertical drop off. Okay, so you'd basically see the magnitude instantaneously drop to zero for all frequencies greater than omega naught. Um, this is often referred to as a brick wall filter. It is a very theoretical model. Um, and it's called a brick wall filter, as, as you might imagine, because, well, it kind of looks like a wall. Right? So for all frequencies above omega naught, you're basically going to get this zero uh, output. You're going to get 100% attenuation in the output. Okay, so sometimes if you you know if you hear the term brick wall filter, this is why. But you should be aware that this is a very ideal situation. Um, so so what we try and do with either circuits, uh, analog circuits, or digital circuits, or whatever whatever type of filter we're building, what we try to do is get as close to this as possible. Uh, and just to put things into context, we've actually looked at one such example already. So we looked at this example where we built a very basic first order RC circuit that was meant to uh, approximate this low pass filter as, as best as possible. 
Okay, so what we found is for this system, you know, we, we derived the differential equation. We came up with the transfer function, which we called P. That's the transfer function from the input voltage to the output voltage. And it had the form of 1 over RCS plus 1. So it had that first order low pass um, transfer function form that we found on our um, cheat sheet of seven fundamental uh, transfer functions. Okay, so we know already that, that this, the Bode magnitude for this transfer function looks something like this. So it has the nice feature that magnitudes for low frequency are all equal to 1. In other words, it will allow those low frequencies to pass through. And at omega naught, it starts to roll off, and it does so somewhat gradually. So it does something like this. And this is the Bode magnitude plot for this uh, RC low pass filter here, this RC circuit. Specifically, we have a slope of negative one decade per decade. So this does an okay job at, at filtering out the high frequencies, especially you can see at the higher the frequency you go, the more attenuation you're going to get due to that slope of negative one decade per decade. So if you're really trying to filter out really, really high frequencies, this filter would likely do a, a decent job. Okay, so the, the question here, right, th this whole setup here uh, is meant to is meant to uh, motivate the question, uh, can we do better, right? Can we do better than, than this guy right here? Um, and hopefully what you're, what you're going to find is that, well, first of all, the answer is yes. We can do much better than, than this, uh, uh, but the question is how? And, and at this point, you may, hopefully you have enough experience with seeing some of these fundamental Bode plots and um, this idea of, of filtering that you might say, okay, well, I know I can at least do one order of magnitude better um, because I know that a first order system is going to have a slope of negative one decade per decade. Uh, but I also know that a second order system, like the third fundamental uh, transfer function, is going to have a Bode magnitude plot that has a slope of negative two decades per decade. So we're going to get better attenuation for the same frequency using that second order filter. Okay, now it stands to reason that if we keep increasing the order, we start to approach this idealized brick wall filter. So so before we get ahead of ourselves, let's at least see if we can build a second order low pass filter using similar uh, components like, like a resistor and a uh, capacitor and perhaps an inductor. Okay, so if we build a circuit like this, it's an RLC circuit that has this particular configuration. This is one we haven't seen before. Uh, and by the way, these these past few lectures, um, you know, we're sort of we're sort of taking uh, taking this trip through this concept of filtering using RLC circuits and trying to connect it all to the idea of the frequency response as we go. Um, but what you're going to notice is that each each of these past few lectures we're introducing a new variation on the RLC circuit. So one of the, the sort of subtle takeaways from these lectures is that you can actually build a number of these different types of low pass, high pass, and even band pass filters using different combinations of uh, resistors, inductors, and capacitors. Okay, okay so, so this is called a parallel RLC low pass filter. And this is in contrast to the series filters that we looked at last time. And you can see that it's parallel because we've got the capacitor and the resistor in parallel with each other. So just as usual, we have the, the input voltage over here, output voltage over here. Now the strategy for solving this circuit is going to be slightly different. Okay, In the previous example where we looked at a series RLC circuit, the, uh, the strategy or the modeling technique or the modeling tool rather that we use was Kirchhoff's voltage law. 
Um, that allowed us to create an equation that governed the behavior of that circuit. And from that equation, we were able to extract the differential equation for that system. For, for a scenario where you have uh, parallel lines like this, uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law is not going to serve us as well because Kirchhoff's voltage law says basically uh, the entire sum of the voltages around a circuit will sum to zero. Uh, well, that's true for even this circuit, but mathematically it's not going to produce the type of differential equation that we want. Um, thankfully, there's a, a, a secondary tool uh, to Kirchhoff's voltage law, which is Kirchhoff's current law. Uh, Kirchhoff's current law basically just says that all the current flowing into one node equals all of the current leaving that node. Okay, so if you, a node is just sort of uh, a junction on, on the circuit. So, so this is a node here, this is a node here, and Kirchhoff's current law should apply at, at every node. We are going to leverage Kirchhoff's current law in this problem because we can see that all of the current flowing into this node, which we can call I1, should be equal to the current going this way plus the current going this way, right? That's just the fundamental fact. If you take, you know, if you take a hose and you split the hose off, all of the water flowing into that fork in the road equals all of the water leaving that fork in the road. It's the same concept with current here on this electrical system. By Kirchhoff's current law, the fundamental governing property here is that I1 should equal I2 plus I3. Right? So this is fundamentally the equation that's going to produce the ODEs for us. Now it's our job to just figure out what these currents are in terms of R, L, C, uh, V in, and V out. Okay? So the current flowing through an inductor, we have to use the, in, the law of inductance, which says that uh, essentially the voltage drop across an inductor is equal to L di dt. Okay, so L di dt, this is the law of inductance. This governs the voltage drop across an inductor like the one that we have here. Okay, the only thing is we want to solve for the current in this equation. We want to solve for that current. Okay, so one way we can do that is to basically integrate both sides of the equation here. So if we integrate both sides of this equation symbolically, we have that uh, it's 1 over L times the integral of, for, for all time, essentially, of now the voltage drop across this inductor is the voltage here minus the voltage here. So this is the voltage on this side is V in. The voltage on the right side of the inductor is the same voltage as it is it, across this entire parallel rail to the ground. So, so this is V out, this is V out, this is V out. All of the voltages along the top rail are V out. So we've got V in minus V out. That's delta V across that inductor. Now don't worry too much about this messy looking integral. This is just writing it out symbolically for the time being. We're going to make our lives a little bit easier on the next step. Uh, but we need to finish. So we have the current I2. Well that's the current here on this top rail and all of this current flows through the resistor here uh, assuming uh, really high impedance at this uh, measurement for the voltage out. So we're going to assume all of this current flows t through uh, the resistor uh, which makes that um, current I2 very easy to express because uh, we're just going to use Ohm's law which says that uh, V equals IR. Now the voltage across the resistor remember is given as V out. Right, all, all, The voltage is across all of these parallel rails downstream of the inductor is all V out. So the voltage across the resistor, resistor is V out and so our I2 is expressed as V out over the resistance R. I3, that's the current flowing through the capacitor, uh, and this is just a direct ap application of the capacitance law, which says that the current flowing across capacitor is equal to the capacitance C times the time derivative of the voltage drop across it. So the voltage drop across the cap capacitor is the same as that across the resistor, it's V out, but the capacitance law says that it's the time derivative of V out. 
Okay, so this is this is our first equation. We'll call this equation uh, maybe I is the wrong. Uh, we'll call this equation one. Now what we're going to basically do to simplify our equation is, well, we don't like this integral floating around here. It's a little bit cumbersome and, and tedious. So what we can do is we can basically just take the derivative of the entire equation. I mean, take the time derivative of the the left and right side of this equation. Now the derivative of the integral, symbolically at least, uh, cancels. Okay, so what we're what we're left with is then uh, one over l. Now the derivative of this integral just becomes the argument itself, which is v in of t minus v out of t. So these are lowercase that implies that we're in the time domain. Uh, but we need to take the time derivative of the right hand side of the equation as well. So we have v out dot over r plus c times v out double dot. So let's just di differentiate v out dot, we get v out double dot. Uh, if we go ahead and write this in a more uh, convenient form, we can put all this stuff with v out on one side of the equation, all this stuff with v in, or the input, on the other side of the equation, and we're left with c v out double dot plus 1 over r v out dot plus 1 over l v out. All of that should be equal to 1 over l v in. Now this becomes our second order uh, ordinary differential equation that governs the behavior of the input and output voltage of this parallel RLC circuit. Okay, so all of this constitutes the modeling process. Right, this is modeling of this dynamic system here. And just to put things into perspective, uh, earlier in the course when we were modeling mechanical systems, we went we went through a similar process. We just use different tools. Okay, so we use things like force analysis and free body diagrams, as well as Newton's law, to generate the differential equations. This circuit is not a mechanical system, so it doesn't abide by those same rules or those those uh, those tools that we use to model electrical systems don't really apply. Okay, so what we had to do is open the toolbox and use things like Kirchhoff's current law and the law of inductance and and even Ohm's law here. Those are the tools that we use to model electrical systems. However, the process yields the same thing. It, it yields a, a differential equation that governs the input and output relationship. Okay. Um, of course, what we're going to want to do is, because we're ultimately looking at the frequency response for these types of systems, uh, we're going to want to uh, generate the transfer function and then the corresponding frequency response function. So uh, we, we know at this point that if we take the Laplace transform of the ODE, we can produce the transfer function from V in to V out. Um, going through that process gives us the transfer function from V in to V out, and that should be equal to a second order transfer function of this form. Okay, so this becomes our transfer function representation of this input-output relationship here for this parallel RLC circuit. Okay, so just like before, we're going through the same process of modeling and then uh, Laplace transformation to get the transfer function. And now that we have this, we can start analyzing its frequency response. Okay, so so if we were just to give this uh, some some uh, some values. In fact, let's not call this p. Let's give this a different name. We're going to reserve p for a different for the first order transfer function. Let's call this q. And for l and c equals one and r is equal to 0.5, let's say what we have is a transfer function that looks like this. Okay, so one over s squared plus 2s plus 1. Um, and, and just to be certain, right, a, a low pass filter, especially for second order and higher, we need to check for resonance because a low pass filter with a resonant peak is really not a well designed low pass filter, right? A low pass filter should really have no amplification anywhere um, and it should only have attenuation at frequencies higher than omega n. 
So what we can do is, as usual, we can go ahead and compare uh, our transfer function to the general form so that we can see whether or not this transfer function is going to have a resonant peak or not. Uh, and of course the check here is to compute zeta. Uh, first we need to get omega n by equating omega n squared to 1. So we find that omega n squares, uh, we find that omega n is equal to 1. We can now equate the s to the 1 terms, which would give us that zeta itself is equal to uh, 1. And 1 is not, okay, this is a strange thing to say, 1 is not less than root 2 over 2, so the implication here is that we would see no resonance, right? Right. If zeta is less than root 2 over 2, then we would see a resonant peak. If it is not less than root 2 over 2, we should not expect a resonant peak. So this is actually a good uh, property for a low-pass filter. You do not want a resonant peak in your filter. So what this means is we have a second-order transfer function with a cutoff frequency of 1 that does not have a resonant peak, and it has a second-order denominator. Uh, based on our list of seven fundamental transfer functions, we know that this is going to have a Bode magnitude plot that looks very much like this purple line here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replace the pink plot with this blue, since we did that computation in blue. But essentially, the parallel RLC circuit that we just uh, derived would have this would have this as its Bode magnitude plot, which is arguably better than the first order RC low pass filter, in that for any higher frequency above omega uh, n or omega naught, sometimes referred to the cutoff frequency as omega naught, sometimes referred to it as omega n. It really just means where do the frequencies start to attenuate. Okay, so for higher frequencies, uh, for any one frequency, you're going to get much more attenuation due to the second order filter than you would for the first order filter. And so the conclusion there is that it's a better low pass filter in that regard. Okay, so we found that a second order low pass filter does a better job than a first order low pass filter primarily because the slope of the attenuation in the magnitude plot is greater for higher order systems. Okay, so at this point you might be wondering, uh, can we do better than that? Can we do better than a second order system? Well, the answer is yes, uh, and it turns out that you can design filters with arbitrarily high order to keep steepening that um, that attenuation slope. Okay, so you can make that slope essentially equal to whatever the order of the filter is. So a, a filter of order 2, which we just found has a slope of negative 2 in the magnitude plot, a filter of order 8 is going to have a slope of negative 8 in the Bode magnitude plot. Okay, so we can explore uh, sort of the next topic in, in this filtering idea. So we, we can have an nth order, what's called a Butterworth filter. This is just the name of the person who sort of coined this filter. Um, and we'll call this, we'll call this example T of S. So there's this idea that if you place uh, pairs of complex poles, okay, that are equidistant from the origin, in other words, that they all have the same omega n, then you could basically superimpose several second order uh, uh, Bode plots upon one another and those slopes would superimpose. So if you, in other words, if you have, uh, at this point we know that if you want to superimpose two Bode plots that have the same cutoff filter and the same slope, okay, so if this is minus 2 and you've got another another one directly on top of that, like so, right, the same, essentially the same filter, like so, then the, the resulting uh, superimposed or the resulting total filter is going to have a slope of negative 4. 
right? So this is what we picked up in our last lecture where we learned how to superimpose uh, multiple simple transfer functions to produce the Bode plot for the total transfer function. Okay, now the idea uh, behind this is that, okay, well, a second order transfer function has two poles, and the cutoff frequency here, omega naught or omega n, is governed by the undamped natural frequency for that system. So if we could somehow produce a product of a whole bunch of these second order filters, all that have the same cutoff uh, frequency, then perhaps we can build uh, high order low pass filters um, with, with arbitrarily steep um, attenuation in the magnitude. Turns out that the general form for the nth order Butterworth filter looks like this. And it's, it's basically what we just said. It's basically some gain divided by a product of several uh, several pairs of complex poles with the same uh, cutoff frequency. So essentially the poles are expressed as S sub K and they have the form of omega naught e to the minus J I'm sorry, e to the J 2K plus N minus 1 pi over 2N and this is essentially for uh, for arbitrary value of k up to an order of n. Okay, so this is an nth order, this is the, the form of an nth order uh, Butterworth low pass filter. And it fundamentally, the idea here again is that you're placing on the s plane several pairs of complex poles that are all equidistant from the origin. In other words, these poles are going to basically trace out. Uh, a semicircle in the s plane, right? So, so they're all going to have the same distance from the origin. So, this is going to basically be semicircular. Now, the number of poles that the filter has corresponds to the order for that filter, but ideally, this is going to produce a situation where we have multiple second order low pass filters all with the same uh, cutoff frequency, okay? So I can kind of show you what that looks like uh, if we if we take a look at some of these Bode plots in MATLAB. So numerically, it's much easier to see these things. And uh, to be honest, the nth order Butterworth filter example, I don't expect you to, um, at an analytical level, be able to, to solve that by hand. I just want you to recognize fundamentally what the Butterworth filter is. It's basically, right, so these products of these second order transfer functions all with poles that are equidistant from the origin. Uh, in other words, they all have the same omega n or the same cutoff frequency will allow you to build up these uh, very steep um, low pass filters. Okay, so so let's start from the top. Let's build um, let's build a, a first order R, RC low pass filter um, and this, this will sort of give us our starting point. So if we look at the Bode plot here, we see exactly what we expect. We have uh, a magnitude of 1 for most frequencies below uh, the cutoff frequency of 1. And after, after frequency of 1 radian per second, we start to see this dip or this attenuation at a rate of one, uh, negative 1 decade per decade. The first example we actually did in, in this lecture was to look at a second order parallel RC low pass filter where we basically derived this transfer function by hand. Now if we give it some actual values like R as 0.5 and L and C equal to 1, um, in doing so we produce another system that has a cutoff frequency of 1 and we also verified that this second order Bode plot would have no uh, resident peak. So we can look at the Bode plots for both the first order and this second order transfer function just to validate the fact that we are getting more attenuation using this second order filter. Okay, more attenuation. So the brick wall filter is going to be, of course, that vertical line. And uh, in this plot, the second order filter of Q is, is approaching that line uh, uh, better than the first order filter. For a Butterworth filter, there's a function that allows us to build uh, 
any order Butterworth filter. So, so the, the filter that I just sketched out uh, on the blackboard, uh, we can build that filter in, in MATLAB very simply by using the butter command. Okay, so, so this first argument inside of the butter command, that's what's going to specify the order of that filter. And what we can do here is we'll just start with, uh, let's say, a fourth order Butterworth filter. What you can see here is the pole zero map for that uh, uh, filter. So, so here's a frequency of one, and we can look at the radius. So we can look at the poles. The four poles for that fourth order system are here, 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 and here, and what you can see is that they're all equidistant from the origin, so they're all going to have the same omega n, and the idea there, of course, is to build a transfer function that simply adjusts the slope while keeping um, a consistent uh, cutoff frequency. Okay, so we've, we've defined that filter to be t. Uh, if you're curious, the form of that transfer function just looks like this. It, as expected, it's a fourth order transfer function, and Theoretically, or at least mathematically, this should be able to be broken down into a product of two uh, second-order transfer functions with the same uh, cutoff frequency. Nonetheless, we can now actually plot all three of those Bode plots and look to see what the effect is. Okay, so the blue is our first-order RC low pass. Uh, red is our second-order RLC parallel low pass. And then this fourth order, this, this T plot is our fourth order Butterworth filter. Uh, an easier way to visualize this is if we kind of cut off some of those frequencies and look at a different window. We can see that the effect is we're getting a steeper slope and we're approaching that idealized uh, brick wall filter. Okay, so, so the next obvious question is why not just bump this up to say like a 30th order Butterworth filter? Right? If you place 30 poles uh, along a uh, constant radius from the origin, we should be able to build up an extremely effective low-pass filter by placing all of those 30 poles equidistant from the origin. Right? So essentially we have 15 pairs of complex poles that all have the same omega n. Now if we were to look at the Bode plot for that 30th order Butterworth filter superimposed on top of our first and second order filter, we see something pretty amazing here. So zooming in on a, a better sort of window, we see that, okay, we still have our first order, our second order, and now we've got this yellow low pass filter, which is really, really approaching that idealized brick wall filter. Um, you could play this game where you, you basically increase the order of that filter until you get some nearly perfect low pass filter. So at this point you may be wondering, well, what's the drawback? Why not just build this filter and deploy it and have sort of perfect filtering? Um, well, to answer that question, I would, uh, I would uh, direct your attention to the phase plot. Okay, so the first and second order systems have phase uh, phases of negative 90 and negative 180 degrees uh, respectively, whereas this 30th order Butterworth filter now has a phase for higher frequencies of negative 2,000, negative more than, so something less than negative 2,600, right? So, so maybe we could even pick out what that is. Yeah, so negative 2,700 degrees. Uh, what that means is we're introducing a lot of delay into the system. Now, based on the frequency, right, so the frequency will dictate how much delay that is in seconds, but at, but at negative 2,700 degrees, you can be pretty certain that you're going to get a noticeable delay in your response. Uh, and that's going to cause problems for most systems, okay? Uh, another, another thing you can look at is to simply look at the time response for those three uh, filters. So the step response for P and Q, those are nice and predictable. They have very fast response time, and they converge on their final value very quickly. Whereas the yellow plot, which is our 30th order Butterworth filter, uh, now we're introducing a lot of this sort of unwanted transient behavior. So we've got a lot of oscillations going on. There's a massive settling time, 
and there's also a very, very long delay before anything happens. Okay, so, so for, for audio systems or robotic systems or even mechatronic systems where things need to happen very quickly uh, in order to achieve the control outcomes or those, those design outcomes, uh, delays like 10 or 15 seconds are simply unacceptable. Okay, so you have to weigh the benefits of improving that slope of the low pass attenuation versus the amount of delay that you're uh, invariably going to introduce into the system. Okay, so there's always a trade off there, and, and there's really nothing you can do uh, to get around that. You've always got to weigh those options against one another. Okay, so uh, shifting gears a little bit here, um, we've done some analysis on low pass filters now. Um, but there are other scenarios where you may not just want to attenuate high um, frequencies. You may want to do both. You may want to squish out some of the low frequencies and some of the high frequencies. Um, in, in that case, we can consider things called bandpass filters. And as you might expect, it's essentially a combination of low and high pass filters. So a typical bandpass filter will have a Bode magnitude plot that essentially allows some some band of frequencies to pass through unaffected and frequencies lower than some low cutoff frequency will be attenuated and frequencies above some some upper range or some upper limit will be attenuated so the bandpass filter generally has this shape and basically it allows it allows this range of frequencies to pass through. Um, uh, and, and this is good. The, the, the most convenient example for this, exa uh, for this type of filter is to look again at an audio system where you're trying to build up um, a nice sounding uh, audio system. And of course, the spectrum for any source audio is, is all the way across all of the frequencies. Um, and the idea fundamentally is to build a nice sound system. You want to have dedicated speakers for each range of the frequencies. So a low pass filter would be combined with a big uh, bassy subwoofer so that only the low frequencies are reproduced by a subwoofer. And a high pass filter would be used for those little tiny tweeter speakers that are only really good at reproducing uh, very high frequencies. Uh, for everything in the middle, so for all that mid-range frequency, you've got sort of a medium-sized speaker that's really good at reproducing frequencies within a certain range of frequencies and not really good at producing high frequencies and not very good at producing really low frequencies. So for that type of uh, equipment, you would want to use a bandpass filter um, so that you can achieve the best audio quality through that one particular size of speaker. Okay, so that's just one example of a bandpass filter. Uh, in everyday life. Uh, to create a bandpass filter, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, and we're going to use sort of the same tools that we've been uh, using so far for the past two lectures to, to produce these two different options. Okay, so you got one option which is basically a high pass filter and a low pass filter in series. Okay, so so you pass all the sound, you pass all the signal through a low pass filter, and then the result of that you pass through a secondary high pass filter, and the ultimate effect is that you should only allow certain frequencies to pass through. Okay, so so let's see if we can let's see if we can do that using our analytical techniques here. So so we know that this has a low pass form. We have a second order denominator. So this is our low pass filter. And then we're going to put that in series with a high pass filter, which we can also build using a second order denominator, but adding uh, an S squared in the numerator. So this becomes a high pass filter. And to see that, we'll have to actually do this analysis. Uh, but hopefully you'll see why this is a high pass filter in just a second. So you put these two in series. And ultimately, what you get is one overall filter, which is the product of P1 and P2. This works out to be, and I'm going to write it in such a way that uh, is more convenient to us, S squared plus 50S plus, I, I should even write it this way, 
I'd rather write it this way because writing it this way will allow us to take advantage of the technique we learned in the last lecture to superimpose uh, several of those simple transfer functions. Okay, so this is P1. P2 I'm going to factor down into a product of three transfer functions, like so. Okay, so writing it this way allows us to visualize essentially this product of four transfer functions and each of these transfer functions appears on that sheet of seven fundamental transfer functions okay so we can label we can label each one of these sketch the Bode plot for each one of them and then superimpose them graphically to see the result maybe what I'll do is I'll just make since these are the same transfer function, we'll consider them the same color, but there's just going to be two of them. Okay. Okay. So what we have to do next is to essentially sketch the Bode plot for it. Now, because we're talking about filtering, the magnitude portion of the filter is by far the most important element in defining the filter. The phase has some implications, as we saw with the 30th order Butterworth filter. If you introduce a phase lag of 2700 degrees, that's going to create some problems for you. But fundamentally, the filter is defined by the magnitude plot. So that's all we're going to sketch in this example. Uh, we, need to set up, uh, we need to set up our axes. Like so. And then we're just going to go... Uh, transfer function by transfer function and, and sketch the Bode plots for each of these simple transfer functions. Okay, so for P sub A, we have a second order low pass, so it's got a second order denominator, and we have uh, a cutoff frequency of 10. What that means is we're going to asymptotically approach, uh, we're going to sort of uh, get to that cutoff frequency of 10, and then we are going to start to attenuate at a slope of minus two decades per decade because this is a second order uh, transfer function. Okay, so this will be the asymptotic approximation for P sub A. For P sub B, we have a similar thing actually, a second order low pass shape, but the cutoff frequency is one. So the cutoff frequency here is going to have the same shape, same slope even, but it's just going to start a little bit earlier. Now it's you might be wondering how this is eventually going to become a bandpass filter because we basically have two low pass filters so far. However, we now need to look at P sub C and P sub D. Okay, because these two transfer functions over here, if you look at the cheat sheet of uh, uh, seven fundamental transfer functions, these are those special transfer functions. And for uh, P is equal to S, that means at a frequency of one, we're actually going to start to increase, or we're going to magnify with the slope of one decade per decade. Okay, so this would be sort of the asymptotic approximation for P sub C, and this has a slope of one decade per decade. But remember, there's two of them. Uh, there's two of them uh, together. So there's two of these right on top of one another. Right, so two slopes of positive one decade per decade. Well, we know that when we superimpose the Bode magnitude plots, we're superimposing according to the slope. So we could actually combine these two into one slope with uh, a value of positive two decades per decade. Okay, so P sub C and P sub D together will give us one Bode magnitude plot passing through the point one at a frequency of one uh, with a slope of two decades per decade. So this would be the asymptotic approximation for PC times PD. Okay, so that covers all four of those transfer functions so far. What we need to do next is to basically superimpose all of these um, asymptotes together to get the overall Bode asymptote. Okay, so let's superimpose. Uh, it doesn't matter what you choose. You can pick any two of them to start with. Uh, if we were to superimpose, let's say, huh, we, okay, we can do, 
P, P sub C and P sub B together first, okay? So, so what this means is we would, for frequencies less than one, we're superimposing the magenta line with the orange line. So we've got slope of zero and a slope of, oops, I didn't mark it here, we have a slope of positive two decades per decade. Okay, so superimposing magenta and orange for frequencies less than one, we're actually following directly along with the uh, the slope here, so the positive two decades per decade. Then for frequencies larger than one, we have a slope of positive two combining with the slope of negative two. So those slopes are going to cancel, and we're going to end up with a horizontal line for all higher frequencies, right? So this would be the combination of PB, PC, and PD all together. So now what we have to do is combine this green plot with P sub A, okay? Now that's relatively straightforward to do because for all frequencies less than 10, P sub A has zero slope. There's no magnitude contribution there. So we're just going to be tracking along our green plot for P, B, C, and D. Then, for frequencies larger than 10, we have, uh, for the green plot, we have a slope of 0 combined with the slope of negative 2 from P sub A. So we're going to basically go according to the negative 2 slope. Okay, so this blue plot actually becomes our asymptotic approximation for the entire original P of S transfer function. The last thing that's left to do before we fill in the actual Bode plot is, of course, we, because we have two uh, second order transfer functions, we would need to check both of those for resonance. Okay, in other words, we need to compute zeta for both of these. Now, for these two examples, um, it's very clear to me at least that the middle term, the damping term, is much larger than omega n. Um, and, and in this case, it's very easy to see that uh, zeta is going to be much larger than root 2 over 2. I encourage you to validate that, um, but I won't do it here just for the sake of time. Okay, so both of these second order transfer functions are verified to have no resonant peak, which means that now we can finally go back and sketch our original, so the Bode plot for the overall P of S would follow along this asymptote. And this has a slope of positive two decades per decade. There is no resonant peak uh, associated with the frequency of one, which would come from P sub B. There's no resonant peak there. So we're just going to expect a nice smooth transition to horizontal. So there's this is the, the band of frequencies that are being allowed to pass through. And then here we're expecting a nice smooth transition to the second portion of this filter. And again, we don't expect to see a resonant peak here because we verified that zeta for P sub A is greater than root 2 over 2. Okay, so in this way, we essentially create a Bode magnitude plot that allows a certain range of frequencies to pass through, and we get attenuation in higher and lower frequencies than that, that band of filters. Okay, so this is a band pass filter. It's one method of creating it, which is to basically put a high pass and low pass filter in series. Uh, now, I did mention that there's a couple of ways we can do this. Okay, so, so, so the sort of combination of a high pass and low pass filter, that's one way to do it. Um, However, we have been exploring these different combinations of electrical systems and electrical components, so why not take uh, a minute to look at one of these examples and, and arrange those R, L, and C components into a bandpass um, configuration. So this is called an R, L, C series bandpass filter, and it basically has it's basically a circuit that looks kind of similar to the other circuits that we've been exploring. But we just put the components in a different configuration. Okay, so again we have an inductor, a capacitor, and a resistor. But by putting them all in series this way, 
it means that all of the current will flow through every one of those components. And when that's the case, the tool that is very beneficial for solving this type of circuit is Kirchhoff's voltage law. Okay, so Kirchhoff's voltage law is going to come in handy here. Kirchhoff's voltage law, which again says that the entire voltage drop uh, around the entire circuit should be equal to zero. Okay, so what it means is from ground, we get some positive voltage in, and we're going to drop some voltage across the inductor, drop a little bit more across the capacitor, and drop the rest of it across that last resistor. Okay, so the equation that will govern this uh, electrical system is Vn is equal to Vl. Well, actually, let's write it this way. So Vn minus the voltage across the inductor, minus the voltage across the capacitor, minus the voltage across the resistor is equal to zero. So that's the fundamental law uh, for a Kirchhoff's voltage law. Okay, um, We can write this in a little bit more of a convenient way by putting the, uh, just writing it in this way. So put all these negatives on the other side. It'll make the computation a bit cleaner. Okay, so all I've done here is I've just moved everything to the other side except for Vn. And then again, our, our goal for this is basically to populate VL, VC, and VR with expressions in terms of Vn and Vout and L and R and C. Okay, so the voltage drop across the inductor is given by the law of inductance, which is just L di dt. Okay, that's just from the rule of inductance. The voltage drop across the capacitor, now this is one of those cases where we're going to have to invoke the integral, but the voltage itself across the capacitor can be expressed as 1 over C times the integral of the current flowing through it. Okay, so we'll just express it symbolically like that so far. The voltage across the resistor, that's easy. That's just an application of Ohm's law. So we have IR. And basically, this becomes our governing equation. Okay, so it's not in a very convenient form because I see both a derivative and an integral in this equation. It's not very conducive to um, producing a transfer function. So what we would prefer to do is just to take the time derivative of both sides of the equation. What that gives us is well, it's Vn dot on the left side. Now, the time derivative of di dt, that gives me L, and I'll write it as I double dot, plus 1 over C, the derivative of the integral of I, that's just I, and then I've got I dot of R. So this is kind of weird to, <coughs> to write, but <coughs> hopefully you can see that this is the second derivative of the current, and this is the first derivative of the current. Um, and this is a much more convenient way to express the equation. And of course, what this gives us is the differential equation. From here, as usual, taking the Laplace transform of both sides, we can actually get the transfer function from Vn to I. That's what this differential equation is going to give us. And so, uh, computing this and then solving for the ratio of I over V, we get that it's equal to CS over LCS squared plus RCS plus 1. Okay, so, so sometimes, and we've seen this once before, um, you do a bit of work and you don't quite get the relationship that you're after. Right? We want the transfer function from V in to V out. We've done some work to produce the transfer function from V in to I, but that's not quite, quite what we want, right? We want the, what we need now is a relationship from I to V out, right? So that at, in the end, we can compute the transfer function from V in to V out. It's an S there. As essentially what we have here, which is a transfer function from V in to I times the transfer function from I to V out. This is this is the missing piece, right? So we've got this piece, we just need to figure out what that is. Uh, now this is relatively easy to do because you're just going to go to the one place in the circuit where I is directly related to R, right? So all of the current flows through the resistor here. Um, and so we can simply apply Ohm's law, which says that V out, which is the voltage drop across the resistor, equals IR. Now this is very easy because this is the equation that governs that uh, 
that relationship, taking the Laplace transform of both sides of this, well, that's very straightforward as well. Uh, because we don't have any time derivatives involved, we simply get that we have v out of s is equal to i of s times r. Or, very uh, in a very straightforward fashion, the transfer function from i to v out simply equals r. And so now we actually we have both of these and we can combine them both to get our transfer function which we can call, let's call this one q. That's the transfer function from v in to v out and that's going to equal uh, r c s over l c s squared plus r c s plus one. So this becomes our option two for a bandpass filter. Right, so this is supposedly also a bandpass filter, and we kind of need to see how, right? Um, what we'll do is we'll give this some actual values. So we'll let r and c equal one, we'll let l equal a half. Now our q of s looks like s over 0.5s squared plus s plus one. Okay, what I would prefer to do here is to multiply by 2 over 2, and the point of all this is to try to express this transfer function again as a product of uh, one or more of those um, seven fundamental transfer functions. Okay, so doing this allows me to rewrite Q of S as S times 2 over S squared plus 2S plus 2. Okay. Okay, so what we have here are, are, is a product of two of those basic transfer functions. And we'll call this PA. We'll call this guy here P sub B. And it's our job to now superimpose these to see if it does, in fact, resemble a bandpass uh, filter. Okay, now th this transfer function here is a little bit more... Um, concerning because the damping term is not substantially larger than the uh, undamped natural frequency. So we may want to verify uh, whether or not there will be a resonant peak. Um, I can do that very simply uh, by comparing this value to omega n squared. Um, and so I could find right away that omega n equals root 2. And then I can equate this term, too, to uh, the, the damping term of the general second-order equation. So I've got 2 is equal to 2 zeta omega n, and that's the equation that I would use here. So these 2s will cancel. Omega n equals root 2. And I can actually find that zeta equals exactly root 2 over 2. Uh, and because this is still not less than root 2 over 2, I can verify that we'll have no resonance. So this is sort of sort of the, the the smallest value zeta can be before we would start seeing um, a resonant peak in the output. Okay, so we will not see resonance, that's a good thing. Now we just need to superimpose these two transfer functions on the Bode magnitude plot. So what we have is, okay, so we've got our uh, our axes here. We've got, let's see, 10 to the 1, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, 1.1, 10. So just set up our axes here. Uh, P sub A, let's handle this one first. This is one of those special transfer functions. So P sub A would say that at a, uh, at a frequency of 1, we will get a magnitude of 1. And so that's our one intersection point. And from there, we're going to increase with a slope of one decade per decade for all frequencies. So this goes in the opposite direction as well, like so. Now just, just a quick reminder, uh, these special transfer functions like s and 1 over s, they have a constant slope for all frequencies. Okay, so remember this is a log-log uh, plot, which has no origin, so to speak. So you shouldn't express this as a line that ever intersects, right? I wouldn't draw this as something that intersects with the vertical axis, because that's a bit of a misnomer. Um, you will never intersect with that axis, because on a log scale, there's no origin. We simply approach 
zero as we go to the left along the scale of, of frequencies. Okay, so leaving it like this with the little gap right here is a better way to, in my opinion, express this uh, Bode magnitude plot. Okay, for P sub B, this is uh, a second order denominator without a resonant peak uh, that has a cutoff frequency of uh, of root two. Okay, remember this, whatever is here represents omega n squared. So the, the cutoff frequency itself is root two. Root two is larger than one. So the Bode magnitude plot for this is gonna look something like this. And then we're going to uh, attenuate at a slope of negative two. Right, so the slope here is steeper than the slope of P sub A. And this is a slope uh, for P sub B. Okay, now our job is to superimpose these together to get our overall Bode asymptote. And for all frequencies less than root 2, we should simply be following along with, along with uh, the Bode asymptote for P sub A, like so. And then for frequencies larger than root 2, we'll put root 2 right here. Frequencies larger than root 2, we've got a slope of minus 2 being summed with the slope of positive 1. So we should end up with the slope of minus 1, like so. So this is our Bode approximate, uh, our asymptotic approximation for the, I keep saying P, I really mean to write Q, sorry about that. So we'll call this the Bode approximation. Uh, asymptotic approximation for the overall transfer function, which we labeled Q in the beginning. And for lower frequencies, we have a slope of positive 1. For higher frequencies, we just found that we have a slope of negative 1. We also determined that there is no resonant peak associated with the frequency of root 2, so we would not expect to see a peak here, but rather, as we go to fill in the actual Bode plot itself, we would see the smooth transition uh, like so without a resonant peak. And this, albeit somewhat crude, also does represent a band pass filter. Whereas the, the, ba the, the band of frequencies is not clearly defined, you can definitely see if you were to define some cutoff or some range that frequencies within this frequency band are allowed to pass through generally unaffected, whereas frequencies in the lower and higher end of the spectrum are attenuated, um, as we would expect from a bandpass filter. Now it turns out we can also verify these filters in MATLAB, and just like there was a Butterworth filter for the low pass filter, there's a similar nth order Butterworth filter for uh, a band pass filter. So you can specify the frequency band you want to allow it to pass through, and you can also specify the uh, range of frequencies that you want to pass through as well. Now I'm going to go ahead and adjust, I'm going to modify the code a bit so that we can see everything on the absolute scale and on a log scale as we've been uh, looking at so far. Okay, so the first thing we can do is to look at our first version. Uh, our, our first option was essentially, um, we'll call it a series low pass and high pass filter. And so these are the same transfer functions that we had done analytically. And the idea was to multiply them together and look at the Bode plot for the resulting filter. So we see, okay, we see that we get this sort of hump, which represents the sort of frequency band that we're allowing to pass through. And then for low frequencies and high frequencies, again, we see that attenuation. So this is indeed a bandpass filter um, to some degree. Our second option was to simply look at an RLC circuit that was configured already as a bandpass filter. Okay, so we just went through this process, the last thing that we did by hand, and we were able to verify that indeed this was also somewhat of, of the bandpass form where you allow some frequencies to pass through and for lower and higher frequencies you attenuate those as well. Uh, we can now look at the the Butterworth filter which is arguably a, a better way to do this but 
um, I wanted to highlight sort of the techniques that we've been uh, working with so far for the past couple of lectures to show you that you can actually build these filters up from very simple components. Um, if we look at a sixth order band pass Butterworth filter, uh, we actually get something that's pretty nice. So this yellow filter, that's our band pass filter. And if we were to zoom in a bit here uh, and set our scales a little bit better, we can really see the effect of that filter. So this yellow filter here really only allows frequencies between 1 and 10, which was specified here in the arguments. So that's our range of filters that we want to let uh, pass through. And then higher and low pass uh, frequencies are, are severely attenuated due to that sixth order nature. Again, however, you do need to be careful because as you, as you start incorporating these supposedly better filters, you introduce more phase lead and lag into the system. So notice that the range of uh, phase angles on the six order Butterworth filter is much larger than that for the, uh, the previous two examples that we looked at. Okay, so, uh, so, so this is just sort of a numerical um, uh, uh, demonstration of these types of filters. Um, and the idea here was to do some stuff analytically so that we can really dial in our ability to analyze filters, RLC circuits, and sketch Bode plots. But we can also compare those to um, more state-of-the-art filtering methods like using the Butterworth filter. And we can compare them all in one place uh, using a numerical program like MATLAB. Okay? Um, what I want you to take away from this lecture is First of all, you, you've got some experience now with how to sketch essentially Bode plots for any arbitrary transfer function. So this is just more practice in that uh, realm, uh, but also to expose you to different types of filters um, and also different ways to produce those filters. Okay, So hopefully you've picked up uh, a couple of new things with this lecture, and those new things ideally would have reinforced your understanding of the frequency response uh, and the Bode plots.